Good morning. Good morning. I know it's the Sunday after Easter. Like it's like night and day, a packed house, past congregation, packed congregation, and then everyone's like, oh, he's risen. We're gonna sleep in. <laughs> But no, it is wonderful to have you with us. I'm Pastor Carolyn, especially to our guests today. Um, just especially bathrooms are in the back, off this little back room. Anna and Becca, who are ushers, they can always help if anybody has questions. And again, as a reminder, and I say this often, and I will when we get to communion, everybody is welcome to the Lord's table because it is the Lord's table and we're going to hear God's blessing of invitation, radical inv invitation, and grace for all people, for all people. Well, with Easter, if being in the Easter season, it is good to celebrate God's love among us and in our communities and in the world where God's message is so needed and that we get to take that message wherever we go. We're gonna hear that especially today in the gospel that uh, John wrote, and he talks about one of Jesus' disciples, Thomas, and the Sunday school children were learning about this today, who, were, he, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus first arrived from, um, from being risen, and Thomas kind of doubted this radical story that Jesus would come to life, would live again after death. So we hear that today. The grace of our Lord, the love of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, which is always among us, be with you. We pray together the prayer of the day, the top of page five. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate our Lord's resurrection. By his grace, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. What we are about to hear in Acts 4, 32 to 35. While the apostles testified to others about the resurrection of Jesus, the early Christian community shared what they owned or sold their possessions to help their fellow believers who were in need. Here begins the reading. Now the whole group of those who believed were with one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and a great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many had owned lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Word of life. The reading continues in Psalm 133. People sang this psalm on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for religious festivals. It beckons back to the time of Moses and his brother Aaron. Olive oil was an important commodity in the, dry, in the dry environment. Oil was poured over the head and ran down into the beard a basic ask of hospitality for visitors and residents alike. How good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the dew of Hermon flowing down upon the hills of Zion The Holy Gospel is from the 20th chapter of John. Glory to you, O Lord. This takes place on the evening of Jesus' resurrection. So he is risen that morning, 
this happens later in the evening. He has already appeared to several women that went to the tomb that morning. It was still the first day of the week that evening while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish religious authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When his disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so now I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Well, Thomas, one of the disciples, one of the 12, wasn't with Jesus when he came. The other disciples told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in his wound left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, the disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief, Thomas. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who see and who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs with his disciples in their presence and that signs that aren't recorded in the Bible. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's son, and that believing you will have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. I love this story. The children today in Sunday school, they saw some videos. We read their youth Bible. We learned about doubt and Thomas and you know what it was to not see Jesus and to think you're the only one who didn't see. But then Jesus, in one of the most pastoral moments, approaches Thomas when Thomas is with everybody and says, look, Thomas, didn't scold him. He said, look, here's my hands. Here's the side, my side, where the spear had pierced him on the cross. Put your hand there. I think it's one of the only times where Jesus actually tells any of his disciples after the resurrection to touch him. It is such a pastoral moment. He reassures Thomas in Thomas's fear, in his doubt, and all of the disciples doubted, right? Let's, when the women first rushed back after the tomb was empty that first morning, they rushed back and the women said, hey guys, we've seen the Lord. Did they believe them? No, no, right? Remember, I know Lydia knows. So I love the fact that Jesus comes to us in our moments of need and reassures us, put your hands here, take and eat. This is my body and my blood given for you. We still get to touch the Lord. We still are filled with the presence of Christ in the sacrament of Holy Communion every time we share it, every time. It is such a loving act from Jesus to say, here I am for you, especially when we are afraid. I think of all the church services happening um, in and around the world on any given Sunday. 
And it kind of reminds me of that room where the disciples were all locked in fear of religious authorities. They were locked in that room because of the occupying Roman Empire that with some of the religious, not all of the religious leaders, but some of Jesus' religious leaders put him up on the cross for all the world to see. I think about how we are so similar in our sanctuaries, whether they're closed in the Northern Hemisphere where it's a little cold, or perhaps um, one of our partnership congregations in El Salvador or Tanzania, where they have open you know, sanctuaries, where chickens and goats are running through. I always loved that when I was in El Salvador. Chickens just ran through worship. It was wonderful, and even a stray cat. I knew I'm in the right place. <laughs> but how beautiful it is that we are so similar to those original disciples because there's a lot of things in the world, and I don't care what decade or century or millennium, there are a lot of things in the world that would have us fear. There are many things in the world that would tell us there is no hope, that Jesus has died, and what difference does it make? I've heard people say that, and sometimes it's easy to believe that when the world tosses us to and fro and, has its, and, and, and carves out our faith. It says, no, it doesn't matter. But Jesus comes to us and reassures us that the powers of the day, whether it was the Roman Empire or any nation, including ours, that still oppresses, that oppresses races, that raises white privilege over others. There is still faith and hope that there will be change in Christ. And that the church takes this message and does something with it. This past Friday, in Whitefish Bay at the Methodist congregation. I saw some of you, but I was sitting way in the back. Um, one of uh, a Christian social activist author works in different various groups out of DC, Jim Wallace, who just uh, is releasing a, a new book, um, Christian Nationalism, the Fake Gospel, the Fake White Gospel. There's different subtitles that I've heard tossed around. And he is an amazing speaker, has seen amazing things in his life, but has said more or less that this Christian message that we know the truth of the gospel that liberates all, liberates all, that God has been in the saving, liberating business from the very beginning of creation, giving us the great commandment to to take care of the earth, not to have dominion over, as that has been so incorrectly um, interpreted, but to be caretakers with each other and of each other and of creation. From the get-go, when Moses and the Israelites, the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt, was that okay with God? Absolutely not. When they were captive in Babylon, was that okay? Absolutely not. Grace abounds, and the true gospel of Christ will always set people free and will agitate those like the Roman Empire or even white privilege to say, no, we are not all free, and there's some work to be done. Faith produces hope that there can be change. Change produces new life and abundant freedom. That is something that Jesus went to the cross for and through incredible love of God rose again. How many days later? Three days later and shared his love and forgiveness with the world. We're agitated, stirred up to do the same. A couple weeks ago, I know I sat next to Danette. We were at one of our partner congregations at Hephatha in one of our, um, the 53206, yes, right? That's the right zip code. Yes, 53206 neighborhoods in the Metcalf neighborhood, about two miles from here, 
but talk about racial disparity, economic disparity. We were there because we learned that their community clinic with hardly any notice just was shut down. This is the clinic where families went when their children were diagnosed with lead poisoning. And worse, if you can believe it. Something you don't really recover from, but you learn to live with. And now this clinic and a lack of transportation, the, the new clinic way out far west, was almost unreachable. And there were, I don't know, Danette, a, hundred, a couple hundred people there. An alder person was there. There was somebody from the clinic or the administration that said some pretty hollow words, I thought, but was there. But the people, knows that they knew the truth and we know the truth together. The truth sets us free and we are being agitated to say, no, this clinic belongs in that neighborhood where it is so desperately needed. So whether you were there at Hefatha, whether you were there last Friday where we were listening to Jim Wallace, Jesus is risen. And I love the fact that our faith agitates us to say, no, this isn't okay. It isn't okay that one of our US presidential nominees has hijacked a Bible and put the American flag on it. Our Bill of Rights, our Constitution, one God under all, no. And I will just say that is a blasphemous sin. And people may get upset with it. And people will leave churches about it but it is wrong. It is not political, it is just absolute heresy, and it is an attack on, Christian, on Christianity. It is an absolute attack. It makes me outraged. One nation under God, and I think how many times um, in the Pledge of Allegiance we have all said that as children, but think about Jesus' commission that we hear in Matthew's Gospel to go to all nations. Baptizing has nothing to do with conquering. It has everything to do with love and loving our neighbors and loving diversity and respecting and honoring all. As the Psalm says to us, it is just such a beautiful um, first part of the, the, the first verse of the Psalm is that we are better when we are united together as kindred, not divided. God never created the world to be divided, ever. Our message is so needed today. And Jesus is risen. And through the Holy Spirit, breathed on us the same peace to say, no, this is not what Christianity is but we know that the truth sets everybody free and that is our mission. So in the summer especially, I just started reading Jim's book. I know some of us bought it, but we'll be discussing that. This is something the church cannot be silent about. It reminds me of Dietrich Bonhoeffer back in Germany, the confessing church that said, no, this is wrong. And shortly after World War II ended, he and his, many of his followers were hanged. We rise up in Christ together when we promote God's truth together. Liberation and justice and love for all. And I will tell you, you're going to hear me say this again and again. It is so needed right now. But Jesus is risen. Our faith is ignited. We rise in hope. Commit to actions of faith and bring change to the world. That is our great commission, and it's rooted in love for all people. Amen. We pray for the church, the world, and all the people in need of Jesus' good news. Risen Lord, draw near to us today. Breathe on us your Holy Spirit, that our faith is renewed and we witness your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Risen Lord, draw near to us today. New life is blossoming around us. Give your wisdom to farmers, gardeners, arborists, and others who tend the soil and nurture plants into life. God of grace, 
Hear our prayer. Risen Lord, draw near to us today. Renew police, firefighters, and first responders to work for the well-being of communities and for the dignity of every person, that no one may need to live in fear. God of grace, hear our prayer. Risen Lord, draw near to us today. You created humanity to be a loving rainbow of people blessed with beautiful diversity. The heresy of white Christian nationalism, however, tears apart your dream for humanity. Strengthen your church to uphold your truth, O Lord, that liberates the oppressed. Open our eyes to the blasphemous evil of Donald Trump's Bible that promotes white privilege and nationalism. God of grace, hear our prayer. Risen Lord, draw near to us today. Renew this congregation through your grace that we might seek you in worship, fellowship, education, and service. Be with those who are sick and suffering, especially in Taiwan and where natural disasters strike. God of grace, hear our prayer. Risen Lord, draw near to us today. We give thanks for the lives of those who now rest in you. Grant us your peace amid our fears. God of grace, hear our prayer. For what else do we pray this morning? You can keep those prayers in the silence of your hearts or name them out loud. Lord, we pray for Shar's mom, Pat, who has um, hmm, so many health concerns and end-of-life concerns and now uh, two fractures in her neck. Lord, we pray for the doctors and the medical staff caring for her and to watch over our family to give words of peace and wisdom in times of need. God of grace, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Give you grace to start kindly upon the former senior member of the Strong Church, Mr. Harrison Kim, and to protect her life and um, hope and keep her in peace and the right hand of the church father priest. Hear our prayer. Lord, we give thanks for the life of Bob Brzee. Um, who has been living in Dallas closer to his daughter for the past couple years, but a longtime member of Kingo. We commend him to your eternal care as he passed away on Easter. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord is with you all. Let's take a moment to share that peace with each other.